Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Paradigm Shifts podcast with your host, Keisha Kruger. I'm an organization development practitioner and executive coach working with leaders to create positive changes in the workplace using behavioral science. My personal mission, share science-based tools and leadership insights from the field that you can use in the workplace and beyond. Considering we spend about three quarters of our lifetime at work, there is incredible science and organizational psychology that could be used to rethink the way we work, lead, and ultimately live. Join me as I speak with thought leaders and business leaders in practice, unpacking light bulb moments for paradigm shifts. Stacy is actually the founder and CEO of the Pink Mentor Network, and she understands the importance of mentorship because her own career and business has been built on the opportunities that have been introduced to her by her mentors. And she works with leaders to solve complex talent development challenges through innovative mentorship, internal mobility, and employee support strategies and programs. Her services drive outcomes in onboarding, upskilling, engagement, and acquisition initiatives. Her sweet spot, though, is industries and companies focused on developing talent from within or attempting to attract diverse emerging talent. So excited for this week's episode. If you'd like to get in touch with Stacey or learn more about her services, don't forget to check the show notes. Hi, Stacey. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm very excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you here. We have some important things to talk about uh, related to mentorship and sponsorship. So much goodness around these topics, but you didn't always have mentorship in your life. I believe this business that you have around mentorship started from somewhere. Can you give us that story? Yeah. So it's interesting. Earlier on in my career, I definitely had the benefit of great mentors. Mm. But like many women, as I advanced in my career, there were just less women at a higher level. And so I was looking for female mentorship and realized, what? where is everyone? It's not available at this level. And so that prompted the mentorship events that started the company I have today, Pink Mentor Network. Mm, Thank you for sharing. And I love that you can connect those dots between having great mentorship in the past to then now providing an opportunity um, for others to connect others to mentorship opportunities. So mentorship and sponsorship, talk to me a little bit about what each of these mean and also what's the value of each? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think we get the two uh, mixed up a lot in our careers. And the short of it is mentorship is a noun. Mm. Sponsorship is a verb. And what I mean by that is mentorship at its purest level is simply learning from someone else's experiences. So we take on new data points to apply to our own professional paths by learning about the experiences of others, learning from them, learning their hardships, how they grew their career, their leadership techniques. Sponsorship, on the other hand, is very much the inventory and harvesting of social and career capital to create opportunities for other people's development, meaning we're making room for them at the table. We're tapping them on the shoulder and saying, hey, I think that you'd be great for this role. We're thinking about the succession of our own careers and who needs to know what in order to carry on our professional legacy. And the paradigm shift here is, I'll add this for your audience because it's really, really important. Mentorship is on the uh, responsibility of the mentee. So finding it, seeking it, uh, a lot of us will have access to some programs, but really mentorship is finding that next person who has experienced where you're going in your career, asking for their time, listening, and then applying what you've heard to your own career. Hmm. But sponsorship is the responsibility of great leaders. So that's a new way of thinking about the two. So important. And I love how you separate them and say mentorship is a noun, sponsorship is a verb. Why do we get these things mixed up and why aren't they valued together? I think because the label 
is sometimes confusing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have experienced great mentorship, you probably have seen it as an advocate or a cheerleader or sometimes a coach or an or someone who is just an ally in the room. But really, at its purest form, it's really learning from someone else's experiences. So what we're looking for might be any one of those functions, but we have to find the mentor who has lived the experiences we need for our career development. Mm. So if everyone's listening to that huge paradigm shift around the differences between a mentorship and a sponsor, uh, ship type of program as um, in a mentoring capacity, I as a mentee am seeking that. Whereas in sp- sponsorship capacity, the the leaders have the responsibility of acting as those quote unquote door openers, if you will. Right? Yeah, I, I don't even think it's so much a responsibility. I think of it as my legacy. Like Ooh. I know I am not going to be on this planet for all days. But who will carry the work that I do? We work too hard for it just to go to the wayside. Who's going to carry on the work you do? Who knows your tools? Who knows your experiences and can carry them forward? I had a dear mentor. Uh, she's 85. And she said, you know, I'm my body doesn't allow me to carry this torch anymore. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm leaving it with you. And that just it resonated so deeply with me that you know, mentorship is really ageless and, Mm. you know, at the highest, at the end of our career, but another, and I know we're going to touch on this in in a future question, but an ageless also means we need to listen to the emerging leaders in our organizations and in our industries. Huge. And so if I'm an organization listening to this right now, I might wonder how do I create logistically the type of program in within the workforce that can support both of these? Where do, where do organizations miss the mark currently and how can they be more successful at creating spaces for these? Yeah. So the answers to the first questions were all around what are the roles required? Now let's talk about the programs. So mm-hmm. a couple things that I see organizations get wrong. There is no end date to the mentorship or sponsorship program. So the average length of a successful mentorship program is three months. And you know why? Because they run out of things to talk about? (laughs) Yeah, it gets awkward. Yeah, it's like, you know, one person having all the answers for your career needs Mm -hmm. and being able to forecast what you're going to need in the future isn't possible. So number one, have an end date. Number two, why are you spending the time pairing individuals? Mm. What if we found the mentee population and we taught them the skills of being a mentee? Then we had whoever raised their hand to be a mentor and we taught them how to be a mentor. And then we created a space where the shared challenges of the mentee population were discussed by the mentor population and shared uh, to help them overcome. And so it's no longer this pairing, but it's all parties have something valuable in this conversation. You know, let's make room for all voices. And Mm -hmm. so I think there's just a radical change in mentorship is stop the pairing. We cannot manufacture these relationships, but we can train people to be proactive about their careers, to seek mentorship, to start that relationship. We can teach leaders how to be a stronger mentor, how to be a sponsor that makes opportunity for emerging uh, diverse talent around them. Those are roles that we can train. And I think that's, you know, the foundation to any good program. Mm. So while being a mentor or a sponsor might come with a shared set of natural experiences, right? Like being able to share my journey or being able to listen in to the needs of the mentee, we 
want to create these organic conversations. We do not want to put it in um, kind of a vacuum or force it in a container where it has to follow this structure. So it sounds completely reasonable that the skill of being a mentor is, and the skill of being a mentee requires some, some learning and training. Where do we go for those things? Like how does someone um, get better at being a mentor or a mentee? Uh, this is a plug here for myself. Mm. Absolutely. You know, yeah. I, I think we spend a lot of time on leadership development programs. Mm. What about mentor development programs? Mm -hmm. And I think there's such a link between that and employee support programs and understanding we aren't born with the skills to find a mentor. We aren't born with the skills to advocate for our career growth, to build our profession by relationship exchange and relationship currency. But we can be taught those things. Uh, and, and in a good culture or a culture of that's encouraging the development of others through our own experiences, it can really create such a great um, succession plan and some mm -hmm. of these things, thinking about the next generation of your organization. And especially in environments where there's a lot of knowledge sharing, you mm -hmm. know, on a, a manufacturing floor where a lot of people learn on the job, we have to get good. We have to get better at training the people who have those responsibilities to mentor those around them. It's a whole different skill set than leading or managing. Yeah. And going back to programming, right, around mentorship, you mentioned two things that organizations are missing the mark on. It's not having an end date and also um, pairing individuals. So how would you say um, organizations are missing the mark on sponsorship programming if they're are if there are organizations even doing it and do you keep that separate from the mentorship program yeah so sponsorship is like the reverse um it's looking it's like reverse engineering talent development so we look at who's already in the executive room what mm -hmm. is their career and social capital have we created um a repository of what they know uh of what opportunities they have for others and do they actively know how to share them with others? For an organization, it's super important that that's also measured. Thinking about, you know, as your executive team is retiring, I like to call it the dignity project. Like thinking about what is this huge uh, chapter that we're getting ready to close and perhaps even package and leave with the next generation. It, it is. Um, very humbling to think about retirement at that level, but I, I don't think your career ends there. You know, that's, that's the legacy work. That's the piece where we can, we can put an exclamation point on our careers when we write the book of the career, even if it might, might not be written, but, and share it with others. So that, that to me is, why you work so hard? Why, if, if I don't want to take all this with me, I want to share it with the next generation. Yeah. And I understand as well that, you know, employees have different needs throughout their career stages and their career journeys. Right. And so it sounds to me like those who are nearing retirement, who are getting that sponsorship level, their needs are now more focused on instead of producing, achieving, um, certain milestones. It's about making an impact. It's about um, leaving a legacy, as you say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm i a huge proponent of that saying uh, there are two important days in our lives. The first one is when we're born and the second one is when we learn why. Mm -hmm. And I think there are mentorship and sponsorship can tell us a lot about that why. You know, that's the heart work. No one is uh, giving you extra compensation usually for these roles. It's what you volunteer to do. And so to me, it's always like wherever we're spending our time volunteering, wherever we're giving back, that means something so much more to the individual. So learning, you know, 
who or what is in that heart work for you can be just as rewarding at that point in your career as the title or the conversation. Yeah. And I often think about the mentors that have helped me get to where I'm at as well. So it's just like nice to pay it forward um, because you know, you know, as an emerging professional, you, you seek that, that guidance and you're, you're seeking that support. So someone did it for you, right? Like, you know, that it's going to be nice to pass that on. So what trends are you then seeing within mentoring programs that maybe leaders need to be aware of? Yeah. So you mentioned one of them uh, just a little bit earlier, but the peer connection inside programs is so important right now because we aren't getting the same organic opportunities to get to know each other or to create that sense of belonging or to develop our culture, especially in remote workforces or hybrid environments. So creating the peer connections. So a lot of people uh, spend a lot of time working on pairings. My, I see that the opportunity here is to create peerings so that a whole collective is uniting, growing stronger together, and then rising. And so I think we can do a lot of work around inside a program, what what do we want? What is the result from this program? And how do we um, offer that underrepresented population or those people we're onboarding or whatever the program is for, how do we get them to build that connective tissue, which will make work sticky? It makes us come back when we know... I belong here. They need me. This is, these are my people. Mm -hmm. So I think there's just, that's something that organizations can do a better job at. Um, The next one that I would say is that role training. So going back to, we start a program, but we haven't equipped anyone to be a mentor or to be a mentee. And so I think, you know, spending your investment on the training of these roles And then helping create that culture where these roles are understood for all. And they're, they're like a badge of honor we wear at this company. Uh, So I I think that there's a lot of work we can do before we ever get into any kind of programming. Mm. Peering and role training. Did you, did you come up with peering on your own? That's amazing. I love that trending word. Yeah, I think it, it's just, uh, and I, it was a byproduct of the pandemic, to be honest, where mm-hmm. there was just so much isolation and loneliness and you were looking for your people. And it it's very hard to find that in, you know, uh, online meetings because we don't have that organic interaction. And so creating a safe space for those organic mentorship opportunities to happen in all environments is challenging, but possible. Now, you said something that's that stood out to me, connective tissue. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I think of it as uh, the threads or the fabric that holds an organization together. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't happen um, by top-down you know, directives. It happens because people see uh, the work they do is important and they like where, who and where they do it. And that, you know, keeps us coming back. So when we think about employee retention and we think about um, uh, employee satisfaction and all of these things that we're surveying, it's the connective tissue. It's the mm-hmm. stuff that makes work sticky. It makes me want to go back. It makes me want to do more. It makes me want to uh, get to that next level. So I, I think there's, the connective tissue is so important because it's that sense of belonging. In an yeah, and, and that discretionary effort. And we were, I was just talking about this on the recent episode that we posted this week. Um, so that's employee engagement. When an individual is putting forth discretionary effort above and beyond, right, their their minimum capacity, that's that's showing – you know, that's showing up for the organization. So I I hear you when you say like, that's what makes people want to come back. And that's true, right? It's something that I feel like I I want to be giving my time to. Yeah. And you want 
to be giving your time and be working with these people, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's a little bit hard to develop when we're remote or when we're hybrid. And so again, using, you know, the peer group, in order to create some of those bonds can be really important. Yeah. And I imagine an organization who's setting up mentorship programming, they're not creating one mentorship program for one type of group or of individuals, right? I imagine, and, and I'd love to hear from you, what does it look like to have mentoring for different experiences, different situations, different roles in the company Um, maybe touch points throughout an employee life cycle, perhaps, or does it look different from for every organization? Yeah. So I, I like to think about it is if we get the training of what it's like to be a mentor, mentor here and what it's like to be a mentee, then mentor is, and I see this so often, it becomes this, um, this empowering duty where, I, you know, my work is so valuable that it now becomes valuable to someone else. And I see it particularly in female leaders. Uh, they'll, they'll step up to mentor and then, you know, they don't, until they're asked questions and prompted, they don't actually, haven't really articulated their own career growth. And so they're like, leave feeling like, wow, I know all that. Like, and it, it, it matters. And Mm -hmm. it's such a confidence building moment as a leader to Mm -hmm. go from leading something to sharing your own experiences to grow others. And that's just a huge pivotal moment in someone's career. And then on the mentee side, if we get that training down, then everyone feels that there's someone in this industry or in this organization that we can learn from you know, my career is my responsibility and I'm going to be proactive about the conversations I have. I'm going to be proactive about the sponsorship I seek. I'm going to be proactive about my conversations with my manager. So understanding those two roles, super important. And then from there, we can build programs to support any population. If we get Mm. those things right, then, you know, you could do onboarding for new employees. You could do uh, at leadership development programs. There could be this, you know, conversation around how to be a stronger mentor. Who are you going to mentor? What's going to happen here? What's your mentor's narrative? And how does that shape the culture of this organization? At the executive table, we're thinking about sponsorship opportunities, not only in our own organization, but in our industry, in our community, you know, beyond. What does that look like? This um, sharing what we have as individuals in an organization for the better good of, mm. of the world. So it's so much bigger than a program. And yeah. and thank you for, for surfacing that and making that super clear because we can directly go to like, okay, let's build the next best program. But what I'm hearing you say is pause. Let's take a moment to get the roles right. Because if if we do not have those roles right, if we don't have skilled mentors and skilled mentees, then what could could potentially happen, and what I've seen in organizations as well, is that those mentor-mentee calls become stagnant, or there is maybe not an awareness of who takes initiative, who owns the agenda, right? So talk to me a little bit about that. So we started kind of going on the macro level. Now let's look at into like a more micro level within a mentor-mentee relationship. If it's successful, what does it look like? Yeah. So I think this is also a mistake that people have been making for a very long time. Mentorship calls don't need to happen weekly or mm-hmm. over coffee or, you know, at nine o'clock on a Monday morning. The cadence of this relationship is up to the learner. Now, why didn't I say mentor or mentee? Because we can learn from each other. Mm. You know, the big paradigm shift here is that when we introduce this traditional mentor relationship of a designated mentor and a designated mentee, we're saying mentors have all the power. Mm. 
They have all the experience. They have all the answers. What happens to this voice? What happens to the person who's up and coming in your organization or your industry? They're taught to conform. So Mm -hmm. I think it's very, very important when we talk about those trainings of mentor and mentee, we give permission to everyone to step into those roles. Mm -hmm. In every room, in every conversation, we can be both the mentor having something to share from our own experiences and the mentee having you know something to learn from the experiences in the room. So I think it's just so much bigger than mm-hmm. uh, you know having coffee on a on uh, having coffee over a, a virtual call or every Monday. The cadence is up to the learner. So when you have a new question, get back on your mentor's calendar, mm-hmm. or when you have utilized what they gave you, a resource or information, get back on their calendar because they'll invest more. Mm. So it's, it's not, it's, it's a cadence by need. It's not, uh, it doesn't need to have to be a burden. So if it's up to the learner, then, and if both individuals can bring learning into the relationship, then the mentor could also potentially get on the mentee's calendar, right? And say, hey, I remember we had a conversation about a situation that was challenging you last month. I have this new resource that just surfaced. I'd love to share it with you. So there's that opportunity there as well. Is that what I'm hearing? A hundred percent. Okay. And, and I think sometimes, you know, as a mentor, we take the conversation with us and maybe on the commute home that day, we're rethinking and thinking, oh, you know, I should have told him this or that. And it's those times where you, you know, can send a follow-up email and say, hey, if you need me to help you with this again, I have some more thoughts around this, this, and this. And here are a couple of resources. Uh, I, I think it, you're, you're absolutely right in your example it doesn't need to be the responsibility of one individual. Let's just think about what's our next question mm-hmm. and when do I have it and how do I best utilize this person's time? Mm. I'm going to go back to that. Think about what's the next question and how can I best utilize this person's time? Just asking that right like out loud, I feel is so helpful in honing in on the topic, the challenge, the purposefulness of the meeting together. That's so crucial. Um, So maybe we've already kind of chatted a little bit about this or some of the conversations you've shared earlier on have kind of lend itself to the why mentor and mentee calls can become stagnant and what to Mm -hmm. do if they do to get out of that. So can you share a little bit about your experience with that and maybe some best practices there? Yeah, I think This is a a great question. And one that I do hear regularly is what if my mentor isn't the person I need anymore? Mm. And I think, good, yes, we should outgrow our mentors. Mm. We should level up. It's, it's like thinking about your career. You know, if, if you want advancement, you're not going to go to the same people and the same meetings and all the same things every time you're going to level up. But And a really important piece of mentorship is gratitude and honor. And I think, uh, you know, one of the things I try to do once a year is just a quick email to all of my mentors throughout my career and my business, just to let them know I'm grateful for that time that you helped me out and I'm carrying it forward with this work ahead. Mm -hmm. And it just allows us to bring all of our you know, those mentors who helped us get to this place, they're incredibly important. It allows us now to bring them along on our journey. And so I I think if you've, if your mentor has gotten a little stagnant, good. Yes. That's, that's, that's great. That means that you have grown to a place that who knows, it might even be a great friend now, you know, it, Mm -hmm. it could change. It could evolve. It means that you're an individual who's growing a professional who's developing. And so I think it's just, I applaud that it's, but it's that recognition of, okay, I'm at a new level. Mm -hmm. I need to think about who has the experiences that I need now. 
going back to think about the next question, who is the appropriate person to help me with that? And I love the openness around the acceptance and not an attachment to an outcome when it comes to the relationship or the evolution of a mentor. I have mentors who are serving me in different capacities. One might be for the industry that I'm in. One might be within the organization that I'm in um, for different needs and different capacities, and they serve in different ways. And there might be a mentor who I maybe not may not need that year, but maybe a year down the road, there is something right. super relatable that I need to to reach out to them. I think the gratitude piece is so so cool and something that would definitely benefit um, any mentor mentee relationship to bring it full circle but also you have that continuity within the relationship as well right yeah and it also opens the door to other relationships so for instance some of my early mentors are now clients because they were part of my early career Mm -hmm. development they've been with me the whole time and now they see me and they're like Hey, come in here and help us, you know, build a mentorship program. And so I I think that's, I mean, I love those full circle moments in our careers. Just the people who you grew up with now become your clients or it's just super cool. I'm sure you're seeing it as well. I'm sure you're a mentor for for so many and it's, you're getting those full circle, full full circle moments um, back to you and what you're teaching. You're also being able to see them carry that forward, which is really cool. I'm sure. Yeah. I keep a legacy folder on my phone and it's Mm. kind words from people who said my work mattered to them Mm. and it can show up in, you know, a, Hey, I needed to hear that or Hey, thanks for this first shot at a speaking opportunity or whatever it might be. Thanks for this introduction. But I look at it a lot because I, I want to know that the work I do matters to people. It, it's the fuel that keeps me going. Mm. And I, I think it's really important, too, to keep those on days where we might not feel our best. Just a reminder that, yeah, it matters. Show up. Do um, something for someone. Get, get out of your own head. Like, it can be so powerful. So powerful speaking to your why, right? And oh my goodness, you're so right. Like if you can, even mentors have a need to be reminded that their work matters. I I would almost argue mentors, folks who really put time and effort into mentoring those around them are doing extra for Mm -hmm. the people around them. And knowing that it matters is really what we do it for. And so that is such a you know, badge of honor. It's such a like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll continue doing this for others. Thank you for sharing that. Um, So be open to your mentor, mentee relationships to evolve, grow, be okay with outgrowing those mentors. That's perfectly natural. Let's not put end dates on our relationships with mentors. Um, Oh, we want to put end dates on our relationships with mentors, correct? Well, so you just, that's interesting. Put end dates in your programs. Otherwise, people feel like they have to carry on this relationship throughout the whole year. So the program needs an end date. The relationship Mm -hmm. between whatever happens in that environment or that program, that could be ongoing. Okay. That's a really cool thing to point out. So the relationship can be ongoing, but if it's structured within a program, let's yeah. let's make sure that we're not carrying it out longer than it needs to. Well, yeah, because most programs, uh, people will the the bandwidth for them. Mm-hmm. You're constantly looking for that mentor pool, and a lot of your strongest mentors. You know, I I see this in uh, places where there are less women at the S, at the SVP and executive levels. So they're looking to create a mentorship program for women, but there's only you know a handful of women at that level. So they're asking those leaders to be mentors, and it's you know we have to make it so that it's not doesn't become another thing mm-hmm. for. Uh, 
female leaders to do. Instead, let's let's showcase what they know. Let's showcase their talents. Make it available to all instead of saying, we're going to pair you with people. We're going to showcase what you know and make it available to all the emerging leaders around that need to hear it, both men and women. Uh, that has been a really cool observation in my work is a lot of times I'll get a male leader who will say, so this is just for women, right? And I'll say, um, hmm, well, have you had a female mentor? Mm. And at that moment, a light bulb goes off. And most of the time, the answer is no. But I advocate for my wife and my daughter or my sister or whatever. And I'll say, well, wouldn't it be a different type of leadership if you were receiving counsel from everyone representative of who you're leading. How mm. would female mentorship change your leadership style? How would it change the business decisions you're making? How would it change your conversations with your clients? Oh, I'm getting chills. <laughs> yeah, and it's such a it's such an aha moment that yeah, it wasn't female mentorship wasn't available to me at that level, but it's also not available to others, to men at the at the male uh, leadership level. So I, mm. I think we have to think about that shift. You know, how and who are we receiving counsel from? Oh, because it's a representation, right? Yep. Yes. Oh, it's so huge. Um, I want to talk a little bit about capacity from a mentor perspective. You mentioned um, after building the skills for a mentor – uh, then when we build these programs, we're kind of building pools of those who seek to mentor and seek to be mentored. So what are the best practices, if there are any, around number of mentees one mentor should kind of have at one time, or is it really up to them? Yeah, so I would create uh, repositories of the mentorship for each mentor. So let's think about this. Mm -hmm. Let's say you had a field of, um, of sales techs on the road all the time. Well, perhaps we could create a mentorship program via podcast where we mm -hmm. recognize the pain points of our young salespeople. And we then ask the top mentors in our organization who have already been trained on how to be a mentor we ask them to just share how they got through these experiences. So then as I'm a field tech, you know, driving through North or South Carolina, I can listen to my leaders with their tips on how to uh, build relationships with my clients, some conversation starters. So the, the, the piece that's important there is how are we collecting this mentorship? And is it available to everyone in need? And so stop thinking about it as one conversation and think about it as perhaps it's, you know, in um, a SharePoint document or it's in our internal communication system or it's visible or it's a podcast like this and it's available to everyone in the industry, perhaps future employees. And we can really get to know the executives who are leading us and what type of mentors they are. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's, we have been doing this in silos for way too long. The paradigm shift is remove the silos, remove the, the barriers that are keeping this mentorship to one relationship. So we need to completely just Completely throw all of the, yes. <laughs> the fundamental thinking out the door and think completely outside of that. I love that you're connecting to paradigm shifts and um, the entire construct and concept behind this. Um, so we've been doing it for so long the same way. And when we do it a different way, we're disrupting traditional fundamental thinking. And so what are the challenges you think that will be in place for those that are trying to disrupt this way of doing it? Yeah, so I think a challenge will be we're going to have access to so much mentorship mm. that that mentee training is going to be important. And in that, because what, what can happen if you just open your ears up to all the mentorship that is available to you? So 
you know, podcasts, whatever it might be, you get a little lost because your voice gets silenced by everything you're hearing and, and mm-hmm. your instinct and what you want for your career. And so I think a challenge might be when we have access to lots of mentorship, it becomes more difficult to choose what we need in our career. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's where we have to really think about career development and upskilling and how do we, um, you know, what is the best role, like high potential programs and understanding the, the, um, the way that we grow within an organization. But then at, from an individual level, just what do you want from your, yeah. for your career? You know, if you have access to all this mentorship, you choose your own journey. I love that. And immediately my mind goes to like building self-awareness skills into the role yeah. training for being a mentee. So yes. How do you choose what's right for you? That comes along with understanding your core values and understanding your strengths, your limitations, the areas that you want to, to upskill and develop, right? And you need that feedback, those feedback loops around you to be able to inform that. Um, so I think those are essential skills to be a mentee as well that go hand in hand with a lot of other weight things that we're teaching or should be teaching um, within an organization on this quote unquote soft skills level, which we we won't call them soft skills. We'll call them harder skills, but essentially, yes. Yeah. uh, Essential skills is probably the best term, but yes, no, Mm -hmm. it, it is. And, you know, I think it's also so fascinating to see the difference in mentorship shared within an organization. So in the early days of Pink Mentor Network, when we had community events, when I was just looking for mentorship myself, I would ask three women, three very successful women, the most successful women who would say yes to me, I would ask them how they got through a challenge I was faced with in that moment. But diversity of their perspectives and industry and ages, um, they came up with some very different responses. And I learned that my path wasn't one or the other. It was choosing from Mm -hmm. each one and cultivating my own way forward. And so I I think, you know, the, the access to those experiences is so crucial as you're growing your career. Thank you for sharing that. So just to kind of bring it full circle before I ask you this one final question, because time has flown and we're at the end here. It's already. Uh, Yes. It's almost, yes. We'll try to wrap it up, even though I know people are probably like, give us more, give us more. So this is the way to give a, to give um, the listeners more. I heard role training and program development very clearly in our conversation. And if an organization or leaders in an organization want to get better at this, they can reach out to a, an organization like yours, Pink Mentor Network, to get support in that. Is that how, how it would work? Yeah, I always start with getting to know the leaders of the talent development strategy and why they're looking for a program. Uh, Sometimes, you know, a a mentorship training program isn't right for all cultures. It has Mm -hmm. to be an organization that's interested in um, growing from within or it, it tends to work out best. And so just thinking about and getting to know one another Uh, And then getting to know the talent pool that they're investing in. You know, what are their challenges? Does it make sense to use mentorship as a solution to overcome that? So Mm -hmm. absolutely. Everything that I do is pretty customized to the organization's um, pain points. And it's very intentional because I... I want to be, I want them to be a success. I don't want to be back at that company next year. I want to share how to do this, how to make it work, and then move on to the next organization. And so to me, you know, it's also, I'm interviewing to make sure that I get the best clients possible for this work. Yeah, you're seeing if they're a fit for you just as much as they're uh, you're a fit for them. So I, everyone listening, I'm going to be dropping Stacy's information, um, more information and links to her services in the show notes. Be sure to check that out, please, please, please. Especially if your organization is 
um, interested in growing within and has a culture of learning and developing and wants to seek developing role training and program development from within. I think that's so powerful. And you're doing such important work, Stacey. So it brings me to the last question that I have, um, which is, what is your most recent paradigm shift that you've experienced, whether it's related to this or other work? Oh, I love this question. It made me think a lot. Um, and there's two, really. There, There's one inside the work, but there's one that's more personal. And I'll start with the personal one first. Um, as a business owner, it took me until probably last year. Sometimes I'm a slow learner on some things. Uh, it took me until last year to realize that my business could create opportunities for my family and experiences for my family. So last fall, I got invited to, um, or I was being nominated for an award and I invited my siblings to come with me. And that was such an aha moment for me. My, my siblings live in Kansas. I don't get to spend that much time with them. They're all in, um, childhood education. And so they're, you know, they're underpaid, overworked, and they deserve a vacation. Yeah. And just having them with me in that experience, it's like, you know what? Work should be more about mm. creating not only a better life, but more experiences for the individuals and their families. And I, it just, it was an aha moment for me that it took me way long to get there, but I think that is kind of a paradigm shift for workforces is how do we not only create a better life for our employees, but create better experiences for them as mothers, as you know, caregivers, as mm-hmm. whatever roles they may have on their plate. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one, <laughs> I knew you were going to like that. That's right up your alley. <laughs> yeah, so good. So good. <laughs> Um, The other one is not every sponsorship opportunity is an opportunity for you. So Mm -hmm. this is kind of a recent observation in the work that I'm doing where, you know, we, we think or have someone in mind for potential promotions, but promotions kind of show up in four different ways. The first one being a promotion to do more work. Well, maybe that isn't the the right opportunity for me. Maybe I've worked hard and I don't need another, hey, here's another volunteer role to do a little bit more. Or a, or a sponsorship could be an opportunity to prove yourself. Mm. Well, what if I've been proving myself for the last two years? That's not the opportunity for me. Or sponsorship could be an opportunity to practice. Now, that might be perfect for someone who is developing expertise in an area and needs a stage to practice those skills or is becoming a stronger leader and needs a stage, a safe place to practice those skills. But for me, who is an expert in her field and is a leader, I don't need uh, another, I think they've been calling it a quiet promotion where you just get more work without any, you know, without increase in pay or title. So not all sponsorships will be the opportunity you need. Look for the ones that really give you the opportunity to rise, to be seen, and to get paid. Like, though, that is, mm. you don't want just an opportunity to do more work. You know, you, yeah. you want to rise. You want to be seen. You want to be heard. You want to get paid. Mm. Just essential human needs, right? You think about being validated, getting feedback, getting recognition, so important. And there's should be no shame around that. But to your point, like, is the opportunity in alignment with your needs? And we're not always looking to take on that next opportunity just for more work. We want to be able to go back and make an impact. Maybe you want to make a legacy, um, leave a legacy. So thank you so much for sharing those tips. And I think that'll be a good takeaway or last moment reflection for those listening think about your next opportunity and what your needs are and the opportunities that present themselves. Are they in alignment with those needs? A hundred percent. That can be a danger with mentorship is, am I still on my path or am I on someone else's path for me? Mm -hmm. So get really clear on what's the right opportunity for you. 
Mm, thank you so much for leaving us with that. And thank you for all the work you're doing and the legacies that you're leaving and the mini legacies that you're leaving through all the ind- other individuals that you're sharing your work with. Oh, thank you for this opportunity. It's been wonderful chatting with you. Likewise, we'll talk soon. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. If you enjoyed this conversation, don't forget to leave a review, rate, and subscribe wherever you're listening. If you know a business leader in practice or friend who you think would be interested in this episode, please consider sharing it with them. I am so grateful for your support. For more updates, you can follow us at Paradigm Shifts Podcast on Instagram. See you on the next episode.